watermelon, 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 watermelon. Let me know when we are starting. We are starting already. I press record. When did you start to press the record? I like to record before the podcast start. That's the fun part of the podcast because they don't know the mic is on. Right? Sometimes they crack some joke they don't think would be recorded. Okay, what if I say something really rude? It's fine. Why not? Really, really. You know all the guidelines about what you cannot say. This is a personal podcast, but it's not like regulated by MDA or whatever. What? I'm not media corp, so I don't need to worry about <laughs> MDA regulations. I always like to be on the safe side of things. Yes. Kate Lim, aka yes. DJ Moonstruck, aka <laughs> the lady with two Facebook accounts. Actually, more than that. <laughs> How are you so many Facebook accounts? How come I have so many people? You like people poking you or whatever? Super poke. Super poke conscience. <laughs> that is so 2008. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is so 2000 and late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the ultimate freelancer. Is that my term? That's what crosses my mind when I think of you. So when you're going to have that little like photo video of me, yeah. it's going to be like Kate Lim, the ultimate freelancer, really? <laughs> yeah, no lah, of course not. <laughs> as long as it's not ultimate freeloader, I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah, so, but what do I define you as a person? You, you obviously do so many things. You DJ, you can spin, you can dance, you can act, you can model, you can host, you can speak Russian. Oh, how do you know that? I have my ways. Research. <laughs> right? Research. <laughs> Just research. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, what do you like to be defined as? As a hustler? <laughs> People call me human cat. <laughs> human cat. <laughs> Hello Kitty. Oh yeah, why do you like cats so much? There's so much questions I want to ask you. But let's talk about like designations. How do people define you in terms of what you do? Actually, because I'm quite wacky as a person. I do have my functions, but people kind of like to call me by my different monikers and nicknames. So there is like Katie, Kitty, Hello Kitty, Meow Meow, Cat Cat. Some people call me Moon Goddess, Goddess of Mercy, <laughs> all these <Why>? other names. <laughs> some of them were like, you know, just somewhere fell from the sky. <laughs> and some were because of some personal incidents that happened. That's why the name caught on and that's it. Okay. Yeah. So but are you a DJ or are you a dancer or are you a host? I'm an entertainer. That's the best that encapsulates whatever you do. I do have a more serious side of my work as well. So I have the entertainment side. Okay. Entertainment is serious business. That is serious business. But at the same time, I also do a bit of like investment planning, all this stuff. So let's go back to the beginning a little bit okay. of your journey. Of my journey. You were from Pioneer JC. You were a smart Ooh, girl. Wow. All this is how much stuff do you think about me? Oh my I gosh. Up, yeah, you were from JC. So you did MESCOM at Nian. Yes. Nian Poly. And then you went to NUS. Yes. And did you do anything interesting while studying? Actually, I danced most of my life, I think. Yeah. Dancing and singing f- okay. since I was in secondary school. That's the main basis that. of your foundation, of your mode of entertainment. Yeah. You know, like dancing that. and singing. So, mm. have you always like the innate desire to dance and sing? I think the singing portion, it starts when I was a child. Because my family, we are very into singing. Mm-hmm. And we used to sing when I was young. We used to sing as a family very much. So this is the reason why some of my friends always say that I'm really old-fashioned in the way I sing because the way I learned how to sing is from my parents. Okay. So the style of their singing kind of passed on to me. This is whom I learned my singing from. And then, you know, as you grow up, there are different trends, different kind of music. Then I'll try to adopt them. But the foundation came from my parents and the kind of music that I prefer always goes back to the kind of music that my dad used to sing because my dad was uh, well known in the police academy as a good singer so he's a policeman but he sings really well so is your people... dad Jay Cho? <laughs> I'm a Lim how can my dad be Cho? Jay Jay Lim no no is your dad Jay Jay Lim? no not Jay Jay Lim oh damn your mom sang and danced as well my mom likes to sing as well I think one of the that's how they met that's how they fell in love yeah, yeah, kind of that. Because my dad was just well known for his singing. So she started singing his songs and, you know, people kind of like realised that, oh, these two are kind of like, you know, going up because she's singing his song, da di da you know, that kind of thing, yeah. So do you remember your first show, Singing and Dancing? Who first show, that was when I was... Primary school, Chinese five? dance. Five? Uh, I don't think it's primary school that's in kindergarten. I think I was five. Wow, so young. Five or six, yeah. Already had your exposure for performing. That was Korean dance. K-pop. No, that was Arirang. K- 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 Arirang. K-pop <laughs> kids dance. Arirang. Oh, you know that one, that song, that song, you know. That very classic Korean song. You know? 
No. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I had to wear the hanbok and we had fans. Oh, is it the one with the giant ribbon at the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh. the one, the giant ribbon. Is that Korean or Japanese? Korean. What's the Japanese? Kimono? That's not. No. So, a, a Japanese version would be kimono. For Korean, is hanbok. Hanbok, yeah. Hanbok. Wow. So, my first ever costume <coughs> I wore in my life is a hanbok. In my first performance, I think. I think the Korean dance, actually, the Korean fan dance in specific was the first performance I ever made. Oh, no. Now that you talk about it, I recall I had another performance that might have been younger because I used to be in singing class as well. So, yeah. At this point, it's a bit fuzzy. Either I did the Korean dance first or I did the singing performance first. Because I recall in those old faded, like, you know, sepia tone pictures <laughs> that you have in your photo album. Filter. Actually, it's aging, not filter. <laughs> Age photos. I remember seeing pictures of both me in the hanbok and also pictures of me in some bright yellow frock, some yellow dress. And then I was in a big group with big red lips. You know how when you're in a performance group as a kid, they always overdo your lipstick. Yeah. It was like just this dark me <laughs> with terrible big, makeup, big basically. red lipstick and then yeah. like the mouth like, ah. It's like terrible that. makeup. Yeah, so I remember that my mom told me that you were so restless on stage and you kept moving around because everyone was singing, you were singing, but you kind of just moving <laughs> around in your own mind, in your own world while singing that you became a huge distraction on stage. So my singing coach, I think had to come on to stage and kind of drag me to the side. They still let me continue my performance, but they dragged me to the side so that I would be less distracting. <laughs> <laughs> this, I think you're putting your whole performance in jeopardy. <laughs> maybe, maybe my, my whole troupe in jeopardy, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, how were your days in Nian Poly and NUS? Fond memories? Mm, yeah, yeah. Both experiences are very interesting. From Nian Poly, I was in dance club. In uni, I was in film club. Okay, Nian Poly, I was in the dance club. I did dance sport. So that's where I started encountering my ballroom passion. And up till now, it started from Poly. Until now, I'm still doing my Latin dance classes as well as competitions and whatnot. It was just one of those things. As a child, I was very curious on a lot of things. And I like things that are a little bit more esoteric. So I saw on TV like this huge ballroom with lots of couples dancing and then the men in the dance performance and competitions were having this number tag on their back. I remember asking yeah, my mom. Is this? <laughs> oh, no, it's just like whenever they have ballroom competitions. Oh, so you have lots okay. of couples dressed really nicely mm-hmm. and then the men are always having a number tag on their back. So I asked my mom, how come like this guy is dancing and he has a number tag? Like strange, right? Why are you picking people off this floor? Well, why is there a number tag? Why do you need the number tag people that are dancing? So that was one question I asked my mom and my mom didn't really give a very satisfactory answer. I think she's not very familiar with what's going on. She said, ah, some kind of competition maybe like that. Yeah, so then I was very curious because I like how the dance looked. I like the costumes. I like the whole atmosphere. So then it was something that was etched in my mind. So when I went to Polly. And I realized that there's such a dance club. So I immediately joined that. I joined it and I also joined like one lesson of cheerleading and I freaked out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a very popular cheerleader. Me? Yeah, if you went on with that line. But how many styles of dancing can you do? Normally, the stock answer I give is 25. But honestly, <laughs> I have not really counted probably more. Can you do belly dancing? Yes. Wow. Do you need to have a lot of tummy fats for that? No, you need to have a lot of muscles for that. Is it? Because you need core to isolate. Muscles, huh? Yeah, core muscles, of course. Which is your favourite dance style? Genre? Paso doble. Paso doble. It's a bullfighting it very... dance. Huh? Bullfighting dance. Bullfighting dance. That is so not Singaporean. It's one of the five Latin dances. Okay. That is in dance sport. Yeah. Alright, so you did some filming and acting in NUS. And also on TV, yes. yes. What shows were you in when you were acting? You mean TV? Yeah, or oh, whatever. Is there anything notable? Notable. Crime watch. Or <laughs> <laughs> I saw you acted as a corpse. I didn't act as a corpse. I died in that, <laughs> you, oh, you I died died. In that series. So that's why I ended up as a corpse. I didn't go on the screen like, okay, Kate Lim, corpse. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not that way, not that way. Yeah. <laughs> in, in fact, I make a very bad corpse. I was told like... You're uh, moving too much. Just like going back full circle to your childhood. <laughs> kind of, You're distracting. Kind of. yeah. I'm, very, I'm very fidgety. Yeah, fidgety. that's the word, yes. <laughs> Did you do any nice TV series? Nice TV series. Channel 5 or Channel 8 or whatever. Code of Law. Yeah, I did Code of Law. Yeah. Code of Law seems to be something that most of my friends have done. 
So yes, Joanne Marie, <laughs> Shuen, they hire a lot of freelancers. And also Crime Watch, of course. Yeah. yeah. So same. I also did Crime Watch and Code of Law. I also did. Were you a un- corpse for both? Was I a corpse for both? You die in both shows. No, 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 no. no. Uh, I didn't die in Crime Watch. <laughs> but you, okay, so you in terms of Code act- of Law, I did. Code of Law, you died. Okay, so in terms of acting, you did a lot of TV series rather than TV shows. Not really. I did more TV shows. TV shows. Any other shows that you want to mention? Special mention. Chinese wise, my world, my block. No idea who okay, I because uh, it's who, known by the Chinese name Tingsa Puloka, so that's how. Who was in that show? Was Fan Wong inside? No, there's no famous faces because that show was shot documentary style. They were shooting like real life stories, and they were actually looking for actors that have real life experiences similar to what they want to retell in terms of their story. So they couldn't get like uh, famous faces because it's not about acting the experience. The director wanted people that have real similar relatable experience so that they can perform much more convincingly and realistically. So I think his efforts paid off because the series did win awards in uh, New York. So wow. that's good. Yeah, that's a good sign. Okay, you spin as well as a DJ. Mm-hmm. Which clubs do you normally spin? At? So far, mainly doing bars. DJ Moonstruck. Why? How do you derive that name? Moonstruck. Oh, oh, because of my matchmaking days. I used to do... Huh? Yeah. What? There's a lot of strange things I've done. I'm a very curious person. Th- th- that's so. the reason I wanted to have you on. Because you seem to have a very decorated and <laughs> colourful life. Yeah, I and I, I'm just basing this just because I've been your friend on Facebook. We've been friends for a very long time. So every time I look at your post, it's always like you're doing something interesting. So that's okay, the reason why you. I wanted to have you on. Yeah, so matchmaking, are you a matchmaker? Yeah, for two years of my life, I was. <laughs> for which company? Love struck. Oh, okay. So that's C. I yeah. was about to say, is it Tinder? <laughs> you don't need any matchmaker on Tinder. You just oh, that's swipe. True. That's yeah. all. Have you been responsible for a lot of marriages and babies? That's not how Love Struck works. Because the conventional matchmaking companies, they kind of follow up with you, like from the introduction, whether this uh, relationship carried on, whether it was going to marriage, all these things. This is like the conventional matchmaking companies. For Love Struck, it's like a portal, like people put on their profiles and stuff. So they can interact and contact whoever they are interested to meet up with. So my whole position in this entire scene it's once in a while they would have like uh, meetup sessions where they call like the laissez-faire drinks. They will kind of book an area in a bar in a nice spot where they book a table and say this area is all for the people that are on Love Struck to kind of mingle. <laughs> so what they do is they hire people like me and a few other friends of mine who are also like, you know, fellow Cupids. We are called, we are called Mr. Love Struck. That's our official title. Your title is Mr. Love Struck. Yeah. Not Mrs. Love Struck. No, it's Mr. Love Struck. <laughs> Okay. Somehow, that was how it is. Strange. Because we wouldn't know who turns up as the Cupid each time because all the Cupids are rostered. They wouldn't know who is the Cupid for that week. So they actually just say that when you are reaching to the venue, just ask for Mr. Love Truck and the Cupid or the person in charge will come look for you to connect you. So what happens is all these people who are members of this website, they'll come down and they can mingle. But people who are single, many of them are a little bit shy and it's a bit awkward, you know, just to come up to a complete stranger and talk to them like with no intervention. So what we do, we kind of help them do ice breaking. The mechanism is pretty interesting. In order to know who is there single, ready to mingle, people who ask for Mr. Love Struck will get a straw that is red colour in their drinks. So most bars are using black straws. Yeah. So black or white. So when you go to a venue, right, you see that a certain table has all the red straws, you know where to go. So that's wow. the whole rationale. So the reason why they do it this way is because in case people are being very self, self-conscious and stuff, they didn't yeah. want to be kind of be the big group. They can be sitting right in the like cornermost part of the entire bar, restaurant. But you see that red straw, you know that she's there actually to mingle as well. Wow. Yeah. I have no idea. What other weird jobs have you done? Wait, wait, we seem to be jumping to a lot of places. But this is why I was asking you, like, no, no, what, no, no. what's our agenda? <laughs> agenda is you. But, okay, so let's talk a bit about DJ before we go back there. Yeah. So how do you learn how to DJ? Is there, like, a course, a DJ course that you went? I had a mentor. Okay. He went by the DJ name of Freak Nast. And he is actually from New York. Okay. So we were part of this whole head candy phase in Singapore. 
So there was like a phase in Singapore where Head Candy was quite popular, Ministry of Sound, these two brands. Mm. So yes. when we used to yeah run all these parties, me and my business partner then were the brand owners of uh, Head Candy in Singapore. So I was there to help to run with the operations and he was my DJ teacher, literally. Him and I also learned a lot also from this other DJ who is still around in Singapore. His name is Adam Sky or DJ Modium. So he goes by two DJ names. Sometimes people call him Adam Sky, sometimes people call him DJ Modium. So okay, yeah. so you still DJ at this time? Like today? Me? Yeah. Yeah, of course. You do so many things. It's incredible. I'm well, restless. What, <laughs> restless. <laughs> what other interesting things have you done? And you mentioned you have your own company as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, what's it called? My company is called Arte Aura. So the name is uh, named by my dear business partner. name is uh, Ivana Jones. <laughs> so, yeah, why, why are you no, laughing? No, 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 you have a lot of Angmo connections, friends. She's uh, Eurasian. She's okay. local. local. Oh, local, okay. Yeah. Pretty not? <laughs> Pretty long, of course, no? <laughs> If she hears this podcast, mm. okay, uh, we'll get her on. <laughs> what what yeah, does it do? She named the company. I designed the logo. We are the owners. We believe in interdisciplinary work. It started with myself. I was observing that dancers in Singapore don't really interact across disciplines. So if you're going to ask a Chinese dancer, like, do you happen to know any, I don't know, like hip hop person? Like, they wouldn't know anyone. Okay. So they don't really interact across the genres. The ballet people will know the ballet people. The salsa is their own group. You know, each of them really keep to their own little circles. And Singapore is really, really small. And then people who right, their are own community, doing yeah. performance arts is even smaller community. And then amongst, it's like a subset of this smaller community of people who are dancers, there's further subsets, which is people who are in different disciplines, like in their specific areas, and they don't interact, which I find that it was quite a sad thing to know la, because okay. you can know so it's much shame interesting la. people. It's a shame, yes. So, your company is like the Facebook of dance. La. <laughs> the Facebook for yes, dance. Interest- yes and no, because Facebook is just for interaction. We actually collaborate. I like to make people of very different disciplines stretch their boundaries by working together. Mm. So one of the more interesting interdisciplinary kind of style of performance would be a campaign I did for Play by Year Music School. So my friend, she's a ballerina. She's like classic trained ballerina, like teacher, really high standard in terms of her ballet. Pretty, not? Pretty, of course. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> I realize my friends' names are being named one by one. Yeah. <laughs> and they all got to come up. Call them out. Yeah. <laughs> Take all them. So her name is Denise. <laughs> Denise. Her name is Denise Tan. Hi, Denise. <laughs> Shout out to Denise. To, I'm getting into trouble. <laughs> Shout out to Denise, the ballerina. <laughs> yeah, so she's a really good dancer. And yeah, we kind of pushed her a little bit further. Play by Year Music School wanted to show something a little bit non-traditional. So they had this guy who's like playing his electric guitar to his heart's content. You know, like really jamming, jamming, jamming. And then while Shredder. his... Shredder. Huh? Shredder. You know what shredding is? Like guitar. That's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah so shredding. So he was doing that. And while he's playing that music, she's dancing her ballet, complimenting the music that was shredding. Basically, she danced to the music. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I lost my words for a moment. Okay. <laughs> now you can speak Russian, right? How fluent is your Russian? I haven't spoken properly for Machka. two years. I know some Russian because I watch wrestling. Then Whoa. there's this character <laughs> called Rusev. Uh-huh. Can you say something in Russian? Привет, как дела? Я Катя. Очень приятно. I don't know what you just said, but it sounds very sexy. Right. <laughs> that means, hello, how are you? My name is Kate. Nice to meet you, kind of. Do you re- learn Russian in Singapore? Yes, okay. Russian school. Have you been to Russia? No. <laughs> and then why do you learn Russian? I wanted to do a business in Russian tourism. Yeah. Hmm? So that was the rationale. Mother it's Russia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it's put on hold at this point. Not saying it's not going, but just because I get really busy with my work. <laughs> you get too distracted. Because Coming back again full circle to your kindergarten. Yeah, to yeah. To fidgety. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Itchy backside lah, You just diagnosed my entire life. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm, the th- I'm therapying you now. <laughs> therapying. <laughs> Whatever. It, yeah. <laughs> so the reason I'm bringing this up is because you mentioned earlier while we were having lunch, mm-hmm. while you were eating lah, I didn't eat. You mentioned that you had speech impediment. So, what kind of speech impediment do you have? I stutter. It's not Tourette's, right? Like, Tourette's, like, it's like sometimes you spontaneously just shout or oh, something. No, 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 no not no, that kind. No, no. So, okay, so you when you speak, you can't speak properly. Yes. I feel like that's me. La. <laughs> Funny enough, I have a podcast, but 
my initial episodes I don't really speak very fluently I feel like through time after 50 episodes I try to be more aware of how I speak mm-hmm. yeah so do you do therapy to help you speak this. yes help you speak better or whatever I think one main issue why I was having this problem as a child is because in my family there was a lot of different languages spoken. Okay. Other than English and Chinese, what else? The dialects. Hokkien. So yeah, my father speaking Hokkien, my grandma speaks Hokkien along with my mom. Okay. There's so much chaos going on. Uh, in and terms then of my language. father speaks also a bit Thai, a bit Japanese. So certain things he speaks in Thai, certain things he speaks in Japanese. So I don't speak much Japanese or Thai, but the words that he tend to use, I would know. Sawadika, <laughs> Kitsan. <laughs> that's so confused. That's yeah, Thai, but, Thai Japanese. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's right. Kitsan. That's right. That. Yes, yeah. So that's that. And yeah, and then there's Malay, of course, because my mom's uh, used Your to Your mom's Malay? No, she's Malaysian. Oh, just it's give me Malaysian a shot. Your mom's Malay, what? Okay, so you're part Malaysian. My mom was Malaysian, so now she's... Not but she was born in Malaysia. La. Yeah, yeah la, that means you're... I'm half Malaysian. Half yes, Malaysian. La. Say so, yeah. so yeah. speech impediment. So as a kid, because I'm exposed to all these different like languages, it was very hard for me to learn because I didn't have a concept of what's the dominant language to use. Imagine if you have like one thing you want to do and everyone gives you a different word for the same thing or the same object. So wouldn't your mind be very confused as a kid? Yeah. Like, what are you going to say? Like, okay, is like I sex, say... Man. Why would I say that as a kid? Uh, oh my God, what's I don't wrong know. with you? Sex. Okay, okay, okay. A better example is maybe, hello. Go back or balik. That's oh, kind yeah. of things like, you know what I mean? Very rojak lah. Okay, I can see... So my brain like works in this way, like, you know, everyone is loading me with the different language, different words at the same time. I get very confused. So when I speak, I struggle to find the right words so I will just stutter I will just jam like the way the when your computer's not loading up it has a beach ball turning <laughs> exact thing like uh, the beach ball la, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so you went therapy to overcome your speech impediment no I didn't go through therapy first thing it started with a realisation what was the issue first that I had to segregate the languages that I've been exposed to so the first thing was that second thing was that I went through tongue twisters because I became aware that speech is muscular. It's just like how you learn dance. You mm. learn how to move muscle your memory. Heart. It's muscle memory. Okay. So speech is muscle memory. And the best way to train in muscle memory is to train the muscle itself. Makes sense. So from then on, I did certain muscularity trainings. I went to read up. So I remember... You did it by yourself? Yeah. I remember very clearly, I imported this bone prop. So I wanted to get rid of my speech problems and I saw in some speech book, some book about talking, speaking, and they said that if you were to insert a bone prop in between your teeth, you know what's a bone prop? No. It's like a it's piece like a of plastic. <laughs> it's like a bone prop. It's a piece of plastic that you bite between your upper and lower teeth. You just mm. bite it like this and then you try to speak with that in your mouth. Oh. You keep it there. Okay. When you do that, it forces your tongue to move because your teeth can't move. Okay, okay. Because you have something right there in between your teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people are very lazy. They don't like to move their tongues as a whole. So when you do that, you put something there, you force your tongue to work. And through my training, I also realized one thing, curious about Chinese speech versus English speech. Because Chinese is a tonal language, we actually work a lot more in our throat area and in our lips. Whereas in English, because there's a lot more consonants, all the European languages that I feel as a whole have more consonants than the Asian languages because you have consonants in the front and the back, like back. So you will see that Asians, if they are not born exposed to European languages, they will tend to drop a lot of these consonants because their tongue do not develop the muscularity to speak it properly. Like you hear the word HDB block, block. So you have the K at the back. If you hear the typical Singaporean speech, you'll say, block. Yeah. Block. <laughs> it stops there. The vowel doesn't really come out. I mean, sorry, the consonant doesn't the come C. out. Yeah. yeah, they don't pronounce the, the uh, consonants popular. properly. Okay. Makes so, sense. with the Europeans trying to learn Asian language, because many Asian languages are tonal, we have a lot more vowels. So, one challenge I see that they face, first thing is to differentiate the different tones. The second thing is that when they make the right sound, they can't hold the sound properly. Oh. So they kind of like sound a little bit out of tune, if it makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, it it's just like when you sing a song, you need to hold a note. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. when you sing a song, it's like 
word for word, you have this different note change. But when you're speaking a language that the meaning of the words is so much changed by, by the, the tone. tones, yeah, yeah. you need to be very sharp because yeah. every syllable is a different tone. You need to have a bit of muscularity in your vocal cords, in your throat area to be able to hold the sound of the syllable. So I would give an example. If I say the very, very common Chinese greeting, ni hao. So to say this very specifically and accurately is ni hao. Hao. So that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. But sometimes when the foreigners say it, they will be ni hao, 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 hao. <laughs> like this, it's not yeah. a bit of out of tune yeah. because they cannot hold that sound with that kind of muscularity because it takes a lot of muscle from one syllable to another syllable, everything is specifically that tone, that tone, that tone. So for Chinese, when we speak English and we are not born speaking that, same thing. The tongue is lazy, no muscle. <laughs> so that's why it just drops all this extra stuff. Yeah. Okay, we have to wind down a little bit because yep, you have run. a meeting. You've obviously been in many different industries, right? So which do you think is the most challenging and competitive? Every industry I've been is quite challenging, yeah. Is it? But yeah. which is the most challenging? Actually, I don't have an answer for that. I think ah, they're all okay. Ah? Yeah. I think you need to know what you're doing. That's it. I think main thing is your energy, your time is limited. So other than that, because you need your energy, your time, your health to do everything you need to do. So as long as that is in check, and also if you have people around you that are very supportive, helpful, and give you like a good energy, good vibes. Because I noticed here and I made very conscious decision that people who are a little bit more toxic in the way they deal with me relationships. Yeah, me, no lah. You're not going to unfriend me later, right? No lah, I want to unfriend you lah. I saw you post this thing on Facebook, right? I'm going to unfriend some people. They're like, wow, I'm still in your friend list. So I'm not toxic. Yeah, because some of them are just ranting on a daily basis about uh, things that... Sucking away the vibes from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm great believer of seeing what you feel okay so I have friends who have certain grouse against certain things that they fight against like I have a friend who is an avid environmentalist and she really hates people who waste things and all that but she puts everything she says into action she has a line of action that agrees with whatever she believes in in yeah, the philosophy one of those people, yeah. I am fine with that but for people who kind of just make a lot of kopi talk and kind of like insults everybody except themselves and they don't really have even like very well-founded and grounded knowledge about what they're talking about. They can make all kinds of complaints about politics, about economy, whatever it is, but they don't really have any real knowledge. If you poke them a bit deeper, you realize they don't really know what they're talking about. Yeah. These people, <laughs> yeah, I find yeah. it's just pointless negative energy. Okay. So I don't like that. So I decided that, you know what? Because if I hang around, I might be one of the negative topics that they'll talk about as well. <laughs> because I also heard about things that are spoken about me that I'm not angry so much that there are these rumors or these bad vibes that are spread about what I do. I'm more amused. Because <laughs> mm. they are talking about these things that are like, huh? I'm dead ah? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's amusing what kind of things people can cook up. You go like, oh, okay. Like, there was some rumor that I was married. W what? <laughs> Were you married? No. You're no. Not. You got two Facebook accounts or more. So I don't know how you. So there's all these really strange things that come from no nowhere, man. So you just you just feel amused. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> so okay. Be it. What have you learned from doing so many things that you can apply in your real life? I learned recently, I think this is one of my biggest breakthroughs, how to deal with people. Okay. Doing all the different sort of works, you meet a lot of people of different walks of life. And each person has his own quirk and his own like, set of values. So when you meet more people, then you realize how yourself as a person, you kind of stand amidst all these other people. So That is so I, true. I feel that when I do the podcast. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I meet so many celebrities. Mm -hmm. Some of them, I feel like I cannot relate to this person. <laughs> but I mean, sorry, go on. doesn't matter. When you speak to someone, some people have a vibe that resonates better with you. Some people don't. But because of all these similarities and differences, you're more aware of your position, who you are. Yeah, that's true. And you have your own face. That's where you ground. Then you know that, yes, these people can be different from me, but we can be different but complementary. And there are some people who are different, but they are not complementary. So, in that sense, I wouldn't say avoid them at all costs. I wouldn't say like be nasty to them. There's no cause or need to be like that. But you just need to be aware that because that person is so different from you, 
even in very simple topics that you may discuss, if you were to say a simple sentence about your opinion on something, that person can read it in a completely different way. So you have to be aware that you might speak the same language, but you don't have the same brain. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's how I see, that's how I learn about people. Sometimes my podcast, in the middle of the conversation, I feel like I'm not connecting or not having chemistry with my guests. Then I will just, you know, cut the podcast short. Because no point continuing because I don't want to have a baseless mm-hmm. conversation. Even having so many guests, I don't have good chemistry with all the guests. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's one thing that I realized as well. I mean, coming back to what you just said. So you also learn more about people in that sense when you yeah, exactly. yeah, meet more people. Yeah, that's why I do the podcast. La. See, I do this with you. I learn so many things. I learn about, you know, language. I learn about your speech. I learn about your dance. I learn about love struck. <laughs> How many things have I learned just by doing this podcast with you? Okay. Yeah, so that's the best thing about doing podcasts, I feel. Cool. Yeah, cool. Anyway, you have a cat to chase. Yes. Thank you so much for doing the podcast. No worries. How can people find you? What is your Facebook? <laughs> Caitlin1 and Caitlin2. Yes. It's like banana is in Pinjapas. Caitlin1 is one with the big I. And not the numerical form. It's the, what do you call that? The it Greek form, is it? The I? The yeah. double I, yeah. So I and double I, or you can look for me in my fan page. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Kate fan page. There's a Caitlin fan page with uh, Kate DJ trying to Moon. flip her hair. Not DJ Moonstruck. You can find that also in both of the profiles and the page will also appear. I think. You're the one with the green hair or blue hair. One of the profiles is green hair, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're, you you always have a thirsty man in your comments. How would you know they're thirsty? Maybe they're just being polite. I'm a man. <laughs> I know what they want. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much for doing this. I really wish that we could have a longer conversation, but time does not permit. So. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, thank you so run. much for doing this. No worries. Thank you. Okay, happy new year, everybody. Happy new year to you. Ciao.